Thank you, Mom Charlotte. So at least from that discussion, we're able to understand and we're able to know who is Ferdinand de Saussure. So thank you for that short background and for that short biography. And now we are now going to proceed with our next guest, who is our second discussion is a 26 years old teacher in Macau, China. She loves to read books and she also loves to listen to music. She believes that life is short, therefore we have to focus on what really matters most. At this very moment, this passionate teacher will be discussing about the intellectual paradigm of Ferdinand de Saussure. Ladies and gentlemen, let's clap your hands to welcome our next discussant, Mademoiselle Bianca Wagen. Good day everyone, I'm going to tackle about the intellectual paradigm of Caesar. The intellectual life of the 19th century was more complex than that of any previous age. This was due to several causes. First, the era concerned was larger than before. America and Russia made important contributions and Europe became more aware than formerly of Indian philosophies both ancient and modern. Second, science which had been a chief source of novelty since the 17th century made new conquests, especially in geology, biology, and other organic chemistry. So during this time, it is when the European structuralism has begun. So it was influenced by Ferdinand de Saussure, and its concept is that language is a system of signs that one cannot identify expression to elements or sounds to words independently of the content elements. So it is one of the most famous books during this time, Horse the Linguistic General. So it is a book compiled by Charles Bailey and Albert Sashihi from notes on lectures given by Caesar at the University of Geneva between 1906 and 1911. It was published in 1916 after Caesar's death. So let's have um, let's have some short background information about the American structuralism. So first is Franz Boas. Franz Boas is the father of American anthropology, and his theory is that people think of other cultures based on the only culture that they know, which is their own culture. So his major concern was to gather information on the languages and culture of Native Americans. So together with his students named Edward Sapir, they come up with the notion that all languages should be described in their own terms. So there should be a unique terminology for each language or words. And they also saw that language is intimately connected with the way of life and thought of its speaker. So there's an intimate connection and in how he lives and how he thinks. So those are the notions of Franz Boas and Edward Sapir. Next is Leonard Bloomfield. So Leonard Bloomfield, his major concern is to establish linguistics as a science, his approach. So he focused on theories. He suggested that language behavior is based on a stimulus response theory. So this means that there is a context that emphasizes the verbal behavior of a person. So during the middle century onwards, psychology made its influence felt into linguistic study and soon afterwards Darwin's theory of evolution was hailed by August Schleicher as a major breakthrough which had its impact on the explanation of language change. So as we all know, Charles Darwin is very familiar or very famous rather with the theory of evolution. So he said that certain words are favored in the struggle for existence and it is useful to remember that there is seldom any connection between a sound or a word and its Meaning. So it means that selection is reasonably free to choose among words and 
so features of the words are actually used might reveal its actions. So the simplest example here are the first set of words, which are I, she, he, it, the, and you, and the other one is obstreperous and catafog. So the first set of words tend to be shorter and consequently easier to pronounce than less frequently used words such as obstreperous and catafog. So this was just an example of a form of natural selections except here instead of biological individuals competing in the physical environment to survive and reproduce. Words compete for a space in the environment of the human mind. Our minds give preference to shorter versions of the frequently used words, presumably to reduce effort. So it means those words that are simple and we usually use in our daily life conversation, those are the words that are retained in our mind. Next is August Schlicker. So, August Schlicker was born on Feb 19, 1821 and died on December 6, 1868. So, he is famous with his book, A Compendium of the Comparative Grammar of the Indo-European Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin Languages in 1874-77. So, he studied that the common characteristics of the languages and attempted to reconstruct the Proto-Indo-European parent language. He believed that language is an organism exhibiting periods of development, maturity, and decline. So as such, it could be studied by the methods of natural resources. And the next one is Victor Egger. So Victor Egger is famous with his book entitled La Parole Interior, or in English, The Inner Word. So it is a descriptive essay investigating the relation between thought and language and phenomena connected with sub-vocalization almost a decade before the appearance of the Principles of Psychology by William James, 1842-1910. It also became very influential about 1900 when much attention was given to various aspects of language acquisition. So apart from the natural sciences, which had much influence on linguistics in the 19th century, as they still do today, the growth of social sciences and philosophical speculations should not be overlooked. So August Comte, whose voluminous course, The Philosophy Positive of 1830 to 42, fifth edition of 1843, um, has been reprinted during more than 50 years and has had a definite influence on the development of the human sciences of the 19th century, in particular philosophy, sociology, history, and thus linguistics, as well since it has always been a reflection of the intellectual threads of contemporary ideas. By the way, Auguste Comte is a French philosopher and he's also the founder of sociology and positivism. So, when we say positivism, it means it's a philosophical theory which states that genuine knowledge or knowledge of anything which is not true by definition is exclusively derived from experience of natural phenomena and their properties and relations. So it is construed more broadly as a way of looking at the world from the vantage point of scientific method, and only those objects or events that can be experienced directly should be the object of scientific inquiry. So there are facts about the human world which are objectively true and that they can be discovered and understood through a scientific method. So for him, there should be an observation and experiment and then the truth will come out. So for him, there should be 
a scientific basis. There should be a scientific method just to prove such things. So that's the end of the intellectual paradigm of Sazur. So I hope you understand and I hope you learned something from this. Thank you and God bless.